Our intent is to figure out how to act in order to regulate and put emotional responses back in physiology. Conscious fear activates areas of our brain that are different from the non-conscious ones. For a practical reason, it will not be important to distinguish between the two modalities. Even because the same fear response features both conscious and unconscious components. This information, on the other hand, is useful to us to understand which functions are at play, which we maybe didn't consider before. Fear of the dentist, for example, can definitely have conscious components, like the memory of pain we experienced last time, and unconscious ones, like those related to the sense of passivity in that interpersonal relationship. Different approaches may suggest many types of intervention. The added value of knowing the involved brain areas is that in this specific example, it allows us to highlight a central aspect which other models rarely take into account. For instance, the fear response one experiences when sitting in the dentist chair activates a motor program of removal of a possible danger we cannot avoid. We cannot simply stand up and leave, or even worse, punch the dentist, no matter how much we would love to do one of these things we are stuck in the chair and social conventions forbid being violent to people. In the short term, this creates a conflict between the brain areas and their functions, a mechanism causing the current situation to be more stressful. Besides that, if the situation frequently repeats over time, a deep learning can be developed, something inscribed in neurology, although an unconscious one, of helplessness and uselessness of our adaptive responses which will eventually reflect in a diffused sense of personal helplessness and ineffectiveness. Let us see another example of useful information which may emerge from the mapping of neural activations. The areas of the brain which are activated in the emotional responses allow us to certainly affirm, certainly not on the basis of hypothesis or theoretical models, that three factors exchanging information are at play in every fear response. Evaluation of ourselves, of the social and contextual rules, and the other's perspective. There may surely be individual differences with regard to these three factors. Some people will be more or less able to manage one of two of these factors. But it is useful to know all of them are always at play and they always influence one another. Thus, Rather than insisting on a single point, we could extend our work to all three factors. First, the exploratory and then the experiential ones. At brain level, every mammal has two different areas to manage aggressiveness, namely intraspecies or extraspecies. The first is directed towards similar beings, a dog with another dog. The other is directed to different animals, a dog with a cat. Their goals are different, and so are triggering signs, and mostly the final outcome. Aggressiveness towards other animals, which can be either prey or predators, is evolutionarily developed to kill the enemy, since survival itself is at stake. Interspecies aggressiveness aims to experientially learn the needed resources and be aware of one's and other's limits and getting accustomed with these social rules. This is why this type of aggressiveness evolved to never step beyond a certain threshold, avoiding seriously injuring or killing. In fact, in this type of early playing, no animal goes beyond scratching. Another important topic relates to the different networks. In particular, we have a tendency to see pleasure as the opposite of pain. From the neurological point of view, the two states relate to two very different networks. As you can see, different brain areas are involved. They actually have different activation factors as well as distinctive evolutionary and adaptive goals. This topic will prove very useful to set up a full intervention, regulating an emotion with reference to its direct mechanisms, but also to the compensating or antagonistic ones. Safety, confidence, and autonomy is not simply the opposite of being anxious or aggressive. They cannot even be considered only as preconditions to develop healthy emotions. These functions and mechanisms are partly independent 
and partly dynamically interacting with emotional responses. When emotional processes are concerned, amygdala probably represents the most studied organ. At the same time, it is also the organ with the most wrong or bad information. Let us start by saying we are talking about two small organs, not just one, as we often read. Moreover, they have similar functions, but part of them are different. For instance, the right amygdala has the role with respect to the instant and not learned recognition of friendly or dangerous faces. Within these organs, which are the size of an almond, hence their name, there is an even smaller area called the central nucleus, which performs many tasks. As far as we are concerned, the most relevant is the mechanism interacting with the periaqueductal gray through which generates physical pain in a certain emotion. This is another extremely important factor because it is linked to primary surviving functions and therefore have a good relevance in the process of modulation of the emotional responses. For this reason, the part related to physical suffering and pain, either experienced or caused by an emotional reaction, must be included among the factors to take into due consideration. There are two different ways of activation in emotional response, a quick and unconscious one, and another slow and conscious. There is a phenomenon of antagonism of action between these two ways. The more one activates quickly and in a more intense way, the less room is left for the other. In order to feel fine, it is necessary to make both of them more responsive and flexible. This can be partly reached by conscious will and glucose intake, both favorable factors. What is more important is the activation of the hypothalamus and the connecting fibers between cortex and amygdala. How can we develop these conditions? Fortunately, it is possible to achieve such improvements in many ways. Body-mind, bottom-up activation, multisensory integration, complex motor activities, new adaptive experiences, interpersonal relationships, doing something creative, etc. We will eventually see how to implement these single aspects.